as our world races at an ever faster pace. We'll land an airplane every 70 seconds for more than two hours. And delivery deadlines shrink. Being an island, there's a lot of medicine coming in. It's always urgent. The skies aren't necessarily the limit for the mega movers. Almost everything in this world you can put in this aircraft. In this series, we go deep inside the $6 trillion air freight industry. Every day, we move the equivalent of 3% of the world's GDP. You name it, we can move it. Showing the people. You have a lot of high anxiety, you don't want to do this. They're just sitting on the runway laughing at me. And incredible operations. It's a little yeah. bit sticky. Whoa, 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 whoa. We have an aircraft on stand 666, which has got an engine for it. You get two minutes to get there. To keep this complex, high-pressure trade airborne. There's 30 tonne of weight on that aircraft. It could tip the aircraft up at worst, or it could damage the fuselage. And travel with an extraordinary array of goods. Now we just need the spacecraft so we can load and then get out of Dodge from out-of-this-world giants. Life-saving medical supplies. It's a very good feeling knowing that every day we are shipping medication that could improve someone's life. Perishables. Nobody is, is in such a hurry as a dead salmon. And components for some of the greatest spectacles on Earth. 21 races, if it took three weeks to get it there by sea, we need a 63-week year. Uh, we have to use that. Put your seats in the upright position, buckle in, and prepare to go max speed with Mega Air. In this episode... This load, in actual fact, is Mega. We hitch a ride on the world's wildest salmon run. Nobody is, is in such a hurry as a dead salmon. From the Arctic Circle, to Japan's top sushi restaurants. Fish have to get from the sea to the table of Japanese diners in 36 hours. The world's largest military transporter swings by. Just a, another day in the office. <laughs> delivering tons of bespoke pharmaceutical equipment. My colleague must be very careful. It's a critical situation. In the underbelly of the world's biggest air package sorting facility, I probably take 20,000 steps a day, as we call it a hub walk. Mechanics battle valiantly to maintain 155 miles of smart conveyor belts. It's critical. If these lines go down, it, it backs up and slows the whole process down. And we follow an irrepressible MD. Now, engineers, don't run away. Wow. I've never seen them move that fast. As she lays plans to ensure her airport is Britain's best for air cargo. I look ridiculous with high heels on and a hard hat. Helsinki, Finland. The Scandinavian gateway to the east for air cargo. And, in a delightful twist of irony, the Finns specialize in fish on a mega scale. So we're here at the cargo hub in uh, Helsinki Airport. This is our 80 million uh, euro new uh, temperature controlled cargo terminal. We ship about 200 tons of fresh fish, particularly salmon, to major markets in Japan. To cater for this astonishing weekly volume of salmon, Finnair built what they dub the cool cargo hub a state-of-the-art 64,000 square feet fridge in Helsinki Airport to keep fish fresh and delectable. So you can see here, so this whole huge space is about five, six degrees, and we've got temperature sensors all over the walls, and it just guarantees that salmon doesn't go above a certain temperature, because if it does, everything, everything fails. The salmon boxes, they're built onto pallets, and then finally they go through these gates into the airplanes. Our whole perishable operations has been, been built around the optimization of the salmon from the sea to the, the table of Japanese diners in 36 hours. Yes, this day and a half special delivery is arguably the most complex and impressive salmon run. 
the world has ever seen. And the journey begins 850 miles away, in the Arctic Circle at Skiavoy, at the top of Norway. Today we're going to visit uh, one of our uh, sites, where we have uh, salmon. And I think our salmon is the best salmon as uh, sushi sashimi. It's the best in the world. If you don't take Jan's word for it, then how about Japan's top sushi chefs? Their Itamai training, that can take 20 years, provides unrivaled expertise. And after an exhaustive worldwide search, they declared the Norwegian Aurora salmon the creme de la creme. Aurora salmon is the best salmon for sushi and sashimi. A fish is growing very slowly in the deeply cold water, so it makes the meat fatty and the sweetness and the texture will be the best. That's why top Japanese chefs are choosing Aurora salmon. To keep up with the Far East's insatiable demand, the Norwegians rear mind-boggling quantities of salmon in massive farms on the Arctic fields. At the moment, we are at uh, 70 degrees north. We're uh, far north of the Arctic Circle. The weather can be uh, spooky. We've learned that uh, the more uh, exposed uh, you can go, the better for the salmon. So uh, the salmon prefer some rough weather. The salmon that we produce here has a very high quality, and we want to give that quality back to the market. So we want to sell it fresh, but that means also as a fresh product, it's in a hurry. So we have a slogan that says that uh, uh, nobody is, is in such a hurry as a dead salmon. So presumably their salmon rush die. To meet their sea-to-plate 36-hour deadline, the Aurora Salmon Run is a frantic race against time. Starting with a boat delivering tons of live fish from the farm to the shoreside processing plant. Right now we are going to go down to the harbour and uh, uh, check if the boat is able to come into the, the harbour. Any significant delay could mean missing the Japan flight. And right now, the boat can't dock in rough seas. The weather is uh, so bad to have to wait. The nature is uh, controlling uh, us right now. This is a bad situation for everyone. And uh, yeah, all we can do is wait. East Midlands Airport, UK. Dawn is broken by a massive beast that dwarfs all the other airfield's planes. The Antonov 124 has landed. A heavyweight champion of aviation, able to deliver a knockout blow to all its rivals. This aeroplane and the T25 have a large number of world records, including the heaviest single piece of cargo ever carried by air. We can put pieces weighing in excess of 100 tonnes, single piece, into the Antonov 124. So we carry pieces of oil rigs, yachts, aeroplanes, helicopters, satellites. Once we carried an enormous cactus plant. There is no aircraft available of equivalent capability. Just a, another day in the office. <laughs> the man who arranged the charter for this winged monster is Tom Blakeman. Oh, Hello, nice how are you? Nice to meet you. <laughs> nice to see you. <laughs> Glad to see you. He organized for a supersized batch of pharmaceutical equipment that manufactures pioneering drugs for a deadly lung disease to travel from Toronto in Canada to East Midlands. Its final destination, a Swindon site 123 miles away. This Antonov 124, every time it comes in, never ceases to amaze me. It's carrying 30 tons of medical equipment the inside of the aircraft. Prior to this aircraft, everything that it carries would have gone by sea. The, the industry just couldn't cope without it. Very impressive. All the more impressive are the Antonov 124's many boasts. 
It can take cargo through either front or rear, has internal roof-mounted cranes, and can kneel to aid loading. Not bad for a 33-year-old. We can start We can start the offload yeah. now. So yeah. Yeah. Away. So this is the consignment of 11 crates of medical equipment. And by this evening, we'll be in a medical facility in Swindon. This will take no longer than three to four hours to unload, utilising these two overhead gantries. The gantries will lift anything up to 20 tonnes. Once the straps are off the crates, the gantries will come down and take it out through the rear of the aircraft. This load, in actual fact, is mega. To right, Tom. Yep. Mega is the only currency Antonov trades in. On the ground. Yeah, and then we'll take it away by forklift. Yeah. 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 The time has come to squeeze 30 tons worth of high-grade gear out of its backside. Overseeing this colonic extraction is Ukrainian flight manager Dmitro, oh, who has a rather interesting explanation for this complicated process. If you want to understand the situation, yes, you must uh, imagine, yes, that you, for example, make a shish kebab, yeah? This is the logistic of this aircraft. You can put one of the big piece of meat for this kebab, yeah? <laughs> right. Well, first up, the kebab needs to be unskewered and craned out of the Antonov's bowels. All the people take part. So we have two cranes on the aircraft, yes, and uh, the capacity of each of the crane consists 10 tons, yes. So two cranes can carry 20 tons. The two overhead gantries are electrically controlled from the module the chap has in front of him. It allows them to lift, lower, and traverse right, left. They'll take the first crate onto the ramp and then a forklift will move to the waiting trailers. To tell you the truth, by our plans to offload this one as soon as possible, because the next, next point of destination of our aircraft is home sweet home. But the delights of homeland Ukraine may have to wait a little while longer. After a trouble-free offload of the first relatively small crate, the next is giving loadmaster Alexei a much bigger headache. Uh, this is cargo is uh, of category uh, difficult. It's very tall, this cargo. Very tall, this box. And uh, for the safety, cable must be changed position left and right. It's a critical situation. And we have limited distance between the cargo and our cranes. And uh, I am and my colleague must be very careful. Uh, because um, distance very, very limited. But we have experience, and, and uh, for me and my guys, it's no difficult job. Well, that's not strictly true. Leosha, ты готов? This is the very first time Alexei's second crane operator, Lyoka, has used this equipment. Nothing like being thrown in at the deep end. Так, а теперь... For the working together with first operator and second operator. So we sync together, working together. If I'm moving, my colleague must repeat the operation. Now you can look. Very little distance between our crane and these boxes. Давай немножко приопустим, опускай вниз. Нет, нет. Леха, 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 нет. Can the Oka keep pace and perform a smooth offload? Or will tons of bespoke, irreplaceable farmer equipment end up as scrap metal? Leoka, stop. Earlier, we saw Helsinki Airport's hugely ambitious mega air takeaway service, delivering prime salmon sushi from the Norwegian Arctic Circle to Asian stomachs in just 36 hours. We have a slogan that says that uh, nobody is, is in such a hurry as a dead salmon. But as we took a ride on the world's fastest salmon run, fish processing manager Thora had a sinking feeling. Nature is uh, controlling uh, us right now. When you have to wait, of course, the customers have to wait, and we don't have time for that, really. So 
this is a bad situation for everyone. After a frustrating two-hour wait, the boat carrying tons of live salmon to the processing plant disgorges its load into quayside fish pens, and only Thora is allowed to get stressed. It's important to not stress the fish at this stage, because uh, if you stress the fish, you will have a bad quality in the fish. If you look here, we got the fish into the waiting cage, and now we're pumping the fish to be processed uh, inside. And this is a very uh, gentle way to have the fish inside the factory. It's not stressing the fish too much. After being pumped by pipe into the factory, the salmon are quietly dispatched to the great ocean in the sky, then processed at hyper speed. Here we have a four or five kilo fish. It's a very good size and looks perfectly fine. <laughs> we say that it's gold. It's gold of Norway. For me, it's extremely important to know that this fish will be like uh, on someone's table tomorrow. So it's quite a journey for fish. <laughs> With the salmon iced and boxed, the robots lend a mechanical hand. This is the two robots uh, we have. So it's palletizing approximately 24,000 boxes every day. This is the shipment uh, ready for Helsinki and Japan. Then, once the salmon trucks are loaded to the gills, humans navigate a grueling 18-hour journey from Skievoy to the Finnish capital, Helsinki. It's a long drive. In the winter is uh, a lot of snowing and uh, icy. This time is quite strong wind. 850 miles away at the high-tech Helsinki cargo hub, every twist and turn of this treacherous trek is being monitored by a Scando Big Brother. We're at the moment in uh, Finne Cargo's control center, CCC. We have the cargo eye tool uh, where we can actually basically see where the cargo is moving in the trucks and in the flights. Looking at, for instance, the salmon that we get from Norway, we can actually start tracking the truck and see where it's coming from. The great thing in this tool is that if there's any disruptions or exceptions, uh, let's say the truck is delayed, we can take action on it. We want to ensure that the salmon makes it on time in, in Asia. And the time pressure that we have, of course, is uh, very high, as uh, even at looking at the, the price of the salmon, the value of the salmon goes down in the sushi markets and in the markets quite fast, so we have to get it there fresh. But still high in the Arctic Circle, the well-oiled salmon shuttle is stuck. Not by lethal icy mountain tracks, but by the curse of all motorists, roadworks. We have to wait, but we have to stop because of uh, roadworks. It's taking time. Yes, yeah, really slow. As the salmon lorry crawls across the Finnish border, it's three hours late and in danger of missing the Tokyo flight. Tiro, the driver for the final 450 mile leg to Helsinki airport, must regain lost time in sub zero conditions. It's really icy. Driving in snow and ice, it's, uh, it's really interesting. You never know what, what is coming from behind the corner. Sometimes it's really challenging because when it's really icy and very windy, it's really dangerous because the truck is sliding with the wind. It's a terrifying juggernaut sleigh ride where, with over 20 tons of pricey salmon sushi on board, one slip-up could cost 175,000 pounds. Come on, move along. Everything is going downhill. At Louisville, in America's heartland, the world's largest automated package handling facility, Turns through another cycle of express shipments. 
it's a hustle, it's a bustle, there's a lot going on. It's just the definition of a mega air operation. Worldport is a place that truly delivers. Every day, around 2 million packages are sorted for 220 countries worldwide. Thanks to a network of smart conveyor belts that divert incoming items to their correct outbound destinations. So here's OPC, Operations Planning and Control. It almost feels like a NASA space center, like you're putting rockets on the moon or something. Yep, this is ground control for Worldport's 155 miles of high-tech belts. Mica is responsible for every single inch. There's 35,000 conveyors in this building. We have a team of about 300 people working on them and keeping them going, monitoring them in real time to make sure everything's running correctly, running at the right speeds, and that everything's working properly. Yeah. Okay. How are things looking today, Nate? We're going pretty good. Uh, I've got everything up and running now. All right, so green means good, right? Green is good. We have 1,600 live alarms on the assets right now. So what Nate can do from his seat with all of the screens is pull up the alarm viewer and see in real time what's going on. Well, in this mega system, it doesn't take long for the OPC alarms to flash up a belt SOS. Well, it looks like... It's lane one. Lane one is actually where lane we have one the issue over in North Corp. Is not green. We have a conveyor that is not running properly. So as a package enters our system, we track it every inch of its journey through the building. Right now we have a, a conveyor that's not tracking packages properly. How about you call Troy? We need to run down there and take a look and see what's going on in lane one. While one conveyor may seem like one conveyor out of thousands here, it could be very important and hold up the rest of the system. So can make or break our departures of our airplanes. I probably take 20,000 steps a day on average. I'm guessing six, seven, eight miles, depending on how well the system's running. So we call it a hub walk. Micah is in the underbelly of the conveyor sorting hub. Come in. Overhead, there are more belts than at a prize fighter's convention. And one has malfunctioned. We have about 20 mechanics in this building today responding to any type of automation issues. What's up, Troy? What have we got? It looks like the, the sudden starts and stops the belts tore some of the teeth out. Okay. Just wear and tear on the, on the belt. So we have a bad timing belt, which explains why the belt was stopping and starting. So there's timing belt with cog shifts on this conveyor that keeps it in time and maintains the speed with the gear ratios. That particular belt, the teeth had been stripped off. So we just pulled the motor in, swapped out that timing belt, and it allowed us to, uh, to get, our, get back in time to where we can track our packages. That's a notch in the belt for Troy. But sadly, his only victory lap is a lap of the ginormous 33,245 conveyor belts. So Troy is going off to do a 300 level inspection. Each week here at Whirlport, our maintenance team performs 3,000 preventative maintenance inspections a week. We have a corporate goal of 99.5% of those inspections to be made on time. We're at 99.99% this year, so we're doing really well. First job for any good maintenance mechanic is disconnect the power. Troy's gonna have to lock this conveyor out before he works on it to make sure there are no injuries. These machines do not have consciences. The thing that matters most to me is that these guys come to work and leave the same way they arrived. So we've got the conveyor locked out. We know that it cannot start now. It's a hands-on visual inspection. I'm gonna crawl underneath, open up the bottom drive guard so that we can see up into the entire drive unit. So we'll take a look at uh, all the components, check for bad bearings, bad rollers, wear on the conveyor, anything that we can come across. All right, so drive pulley looks good. Take up pulley looks good. Snub roller looks good. Tracking assembly looks good. Bearings on the take-up roller look good. That's pretty much it. Well, that's confirmed, this conveyor looks good. It, it's critical. If these lines go down, it, it backs up and slows the whole process down. You 
know, when we when we see these planes take off every day without a hitch, everything goes out on time. You know, it's very satisfying to know that we've done a good job. And the proof of that good job is in the Operation Control Center. All their displays are lit up green. And we all know green means go. Perfect. Looks like everything's running fine there. All right, how is the rest of the building running? Right now we're running well. All green right now. Looks great. Green is good. Worldport is the world's largest air hub. Flights come in from all over the globe, and we sort the packages and the flights go back out. This room controls where those packages go. This team ensures those packages move through the building and onto the right planes so they can make their service. The building's running good. Everything is green. That means it's running. That means we're happy. At East Midlands Airport, it's a critical situation. Nerves on board the gigantic Antonov freighter are as taut as the crane cable wires supporting tons of pharmaceutical manufacturing equipment. Леха, 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 нет. Alexei and his rookie co-crane operator must work perfectly in tandem to offload the tallest crate of the 30-ton cargo. Maximum now we have six, seven centimeters. It's not very good for the safety. We must be careful. Ну давай приподнимаем вверх. Нормально. Там не касается, не касается там ничего. Там все хорошо. Леха, стоп. Поехали. Twenty minutes of synchronized boxes ballet. Леха, хорош. Sees Alexei and his rookie companion clear the claustrophobic Antonov interior. Stop. Now I operate uh, because better moving cargo when we have a little distance between the ground and cargo. For the safety of all the people uh, walking around the cargo. Safely unloaded, Alexei's young protege comes through his baptism of fire with flying colors. Uh, it's a very young technician and uh, it was job operation with the crowd. I think we'll be load master in the future. Back to the present, there's still nine more boxes to unload, all under the watchful eye of the guy who helped give birth to its contents. I'm part of a team that's designed and fabricated this equipment. Various pieces such as tanks, mixing units, a lot of different piping and platforms and other things of that nature. This is lipid tank. It's funny what they spray painted on the side of it. <laughs> Lipids are a type of fat, Correct. and it's yeah. used in, in part of the making of the drug. So it makes kind of like a little fat bubble around the, the antibiotic to help with the delivery of it. So, so it's like partially disclosing the formulation on the side of the crate. <laughs> we went with the Antonov option because it ended up saving so much time, and this allowed us to uh, gain back time that we couldn't otherwise get. Yes, taking the admittedly pricier air route Trump sea shipping by a good three weeks. In less than a day, 11 bulky crates have loaded in Toronto, Canada, flown five and a half thousand miles, then unloaded onto five trailers, ready for a short hop to their final destination, Swindon. Good job, guys. Thank you very much. Oh, all was well. It's another successful delivery in yet another foreign field. Then, yes, I fly the load master. I can fly another country and look in many, many countries. Tourist. <laughs> I calculate how much countries uh, I visited. 163. I hope we fly here next time and uh, see again. <laughs> the pharmaceutical equipment may be out of Alexei's globe-trotting hands, but it isn't home and dry yet. The last few yards of its journey will be the most fraught, as millions of pounds of state-of-the-art gear hang in the balance. The wind is picking up now. Ow. Ow. Somewhere deep in the heart of Finland, the pressure is on. Come on, move along. 
The latest batch of highly valuable salmon sushi, bound for Tokyo's fine dining clientele, is way behind schedule. Mm, a little bit worried. It is really stressful. So much pressure and hopefully we'll get onto the flight. It's real bad. It's 9 a.m. and the salmon truck should already be at Helsinki Airport, over a hundred miles away. Finnair strategist Peter is determined this highly valuable shipment doesn't turn decidedly fishy. Fish which are on board that truck, they have to get to uh, Tokyo today and the flight leaves at 5.30. Um, it was due in a couple of hours ago, the truck, but we've seen from our in-flight GPS and also uh, we've heard from the truck driver that have been a few delays. We're not quite sure of the reasons, but a couple of hours. So I'm just heading in now to um, speak to my colleagues at the Cool Control Centre and see if we can get any more information on, on when the truck is expected to, to arrive. Under the ever-watchful cargo eye, Yannicka is across up-to-the-minute live tracking info from all Finnair's shipments. Hey, Yannicka, how are you doing? So, give me any idea about how late it's going to be. Yeah, approximately two hours. The flight leaves at 5.30. Yep. So, is that quite a tight time frame for it to be offloaded? It's pretty tight, but uh, the guys in the warehouse are aware. Mm -hmm. So, basically, they unload the truck as yep. soon as it arrives. Outside, the A350 plane scheduled to freight the 10 tons of Norwegian salmon to Tokyo arrives. All Peter can do now is wait and hope the truck can rapidly negotiate Helsinki's clogged up streets. Now it's some traffic, but I do my best. This is only what I can do. About quarter to 12. We'll have about five hours before the Tokyo flight at 5.30. Slightly nervous. Eventually, the truck docks into its unloading bay over two hours late. With time scarce, a squadron of forklifts spring into action to whisk off hundreds of boxes of succulent Arctic salmon. My hurry is ended, but now it's the same hurry. Hurry to catch the plane. The fish is coming off the, the salmon truck now. A tablet on their forklifts that tell them exactly where they need to go. So it should be quite a smooth operation, I hope. Once off the truck and into the 80 million euro cool storage, the boxes must be rapidly assembled into perfect cubes on aircraft pallets. I suppose to us it looks a bit like Tetris. Or some kind of there's some kind of complexity there, but I think for these guys, they're experts. There's an element of this kind of Nordic precision. I'm speaking from like the perspective of, of a Scot here. So things work very, very much uh, to the clock. Everybody has clear roles decided in advance. This human expertise combined with data and, and intelligent decisions being made by computer. So you've got all the elements. And at, at the end of the day, you have Japanese consumers who are able to eat sushi 36 hours since it's left the water in Norway. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really impressive. In just two hours since the salmon arrived, three flight pallets of neatly stacked boxes containing roughly 25,000 dishes of sushi are ready to be stowed on the 5.30 passenger flight to Tokyo. We carry all sorts under, under passengers' feet, and, and, and in fact, of course, on a, on a normal flight to key Asian destinations, you'll actually have far more fish than you will have passengers. So we're going to get a unique perspective of where the salmon is going to go. So this is where the cargo sits, at the front of the plane. This is 170 centimetres high. We're at the front of the plane here. Right above us are the, the business uh, class passengers. So maybe I could, maybe we can like tickle their feet or something. Well, Peter, don't get too complacent. If the salmon doesn't make it safely onto the Japan flight, salivating sushi guzzlers won't be tickled pink. It's all a stir in Swindon, England. The 18. The 18.
I pity the fool. How'd I get here? 30 tons of pharmaceutical manufacturing equipment, air freighted from Canada in one of the world's largest cargo planes, the Antonov 124, is ready to be hoisted into its final resting place. You need to slow it left a bit more, Steve. Slightly left, mate, slightly left. We're in Swindon and we're building a pharmaceutical uh, equipment for uh, people who are ill and everything like that. So we're just getting the machines, bringing them down, lifting them up into the roof, putting them into place, bolting it together. You don't want to do anything wrong. You don't want to knock anything. You don't want to damage the roof. You just want to get it right into the hole and get it right. Well, we've seen firsthand the professionalism of the Ukrainian Antonov crew offloading the freight. Now it's up to the English to finish the job. Down here, you have uh, the slingers. All of us are down here when it gets slung, so we've got a, a thousand eyes on the machine so nothing gets damaged or broken. All right. Yep, out, oh, there we go. He's going up there, dropping it through into the roof, into another room in there, and then from in there, it's been skating into place and connecting onto all the other little bits that we've got in there already. Just a normal day. <laughs> When you're doing a crane lift, the weather is the most ultimate thing. You want the weather to be your friend. You can always work in the rain with a crane, but you can't work when it's windy. Of course, today, Mother Nature is a cruel mistress. The wind is picking up now. It is picking up. And the weather's getting bad in like the next 10 minutes. So we need to get this piece in before the wind does get up. OK, drive your nerve, mate, if you're not happy to be. Oh, it's bad up here. Tell it, it's bad, he's blowing the birds off course. The rain's coming in, the wind's coming in from all directions. Having successfully air freighted this complex, fragile manufacturing equipment five and a half thousand miles from Canada, <laughs> the last few feet are rapidly becoming the most nerve wracking. This is very tight. Very, very, very slowly down through the hole, mate. Very, very slowly. Very, very tight. Steady, steady. Yeah, that's fine. OK, slow it right down, slow it right down, slow it right down, and stop, and stop, full stop. That was close. 30 tonnes of pharmaceutical equipment has completed its epic journey. Once it's plumbed in, it will start producing groundbreaking lung disease medicine thanks in part to the power and incredible load-lugging capacity of the gigantic Antonov 124 transporter. The Antonov carries things that no other aeroplane and very few other means of transport can carry. If you need to move something in a hurry and it won't fit into a 747 or similar conventional aeroplane, then the solution for you is the Antonov 124. As we've seen, East Midlands Airport is a favourite port of call for mega transporter the Antonov. Britain's busiest pure cargo hub has ambitious plans to increase its global reach. The brains behind this growth is the appropriately named Karen Smart. Karen, Karen nice, nice to meet you. you. Yeah. You I look ridiculous with high heels on and a hard hat. She's come to see the site of a gigantic new facility for a global delivery service. God, it's bigger than you think when well, you've got it all laid out and no, flattened flat. here, isn't it? Blimey. So this is a £114 million investment, um, about 36,000 square foot building, um, and uh, it really is uh, the opportunity to develop the cargo operation here at the airport. Karen's always been a high flyer. A distinguished RAF career was followed by an exec role at Stansted Airport. But as one of only two UK airport female MDs, she's an avid champion for equal opportunity. Aviation's in my blood. I'm probably fairly unusual and relatively unique in the UK. There aren't too many of us. Count on one hand the number of female leaders of airports. But, you know, there's opportunities for everybody. And gender, race should not come into who can do my job or any job at an airport. Today, as well as running all aspects of the airport, Karen must swat up for a keynote speech in London. 
Hiya, how Hi. are we doing? Uh, speech for Ooh, yeah. Wednesday. Wednesday. Right. So, you've got 20, 25 minutes. Okay. You will be projected onto a giant 26 metre IMAX screen behind you, so everyone will get a good view. Long and slim, uh, I hope. But it's a really, really great opportunity to talk about the uniqueness of the airport. Sleeves rolled up and let's get on with it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah thank Fine. you. Take Good luck. Luck. See you later. Thanks, then Karen's off on one of her infamous airport walkabouts. Hello there. Hi. With customer relations manager Andy. It is nice to uh, get Karen over here, but she does have a habit of uh, spotting those things that <laughs> I've walked past 20 times and going, what's that? Eagle eyes, as we call her. He loves it, really. We've got about 8,000 people in total on site that work in round the clock. But, you know, I'd like to think that we're a lot more personal than most airports. What we want is it to be an enjoyable place. Hi, how are you doing? Hi. Yeah, good and you? Hi, how are you doing? Now, engineers, don't run away. Come back. <laughs> You've never seen him move that fast. I've never seen him move that fast at all. I come through at least once a week and spend a bit of time with the staff and just getting a feel for what's going on. Working with our staff and with the customers is the best part of the job. Got to try the new men's fragrance? Uh, yeah, go for it. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> oh, that's nice. <laughs> then finally... It is your escort to wait. So bring your Let's go. Fire section, here we come. <laughs> With Christmas on the doorstep... We're going to the fire section because I've got some good news for them. Karen's the bearer of good tidings. I feel a little bit like Silla Black. Now, Paddy, how's your day going so far? My nose is going to get better. How about two new bikes and a full maintenance contract? Ooh. Firefighters are really uh, keen that this is um, something that the whole of the airport can use, all the staff. So he's been saying to me we need spikes particularly. So that's what we've come to deliver some good news for. I'm dead sure. And that's another thing off my tick list. Well, that should keep everyone at the airport leaner and meaner and help the place soar to new heights. To be MD of this airport, I take as a real privilege, something that gets me out of bed every morning. I love it, I love it. Time for a cup of tea. Is anybody buying me lunch? <laughs> Earlier, we saw how Finnair were busting a gun to hit their 36-hour Arctic cash to Tokyo plate deadline of highly prized salmon sushi for Japan's dining elite. This fish will be on someone's table tomorrow, so it's quite a journey for fish. <laughs> Having suffered delays en route... So much pressure. Hopefully it will get under the flight. Ten tons of prime Norwegian salmon was rushed through their cool cargo hub. And now, in the nick of time, three flight pallets are wrapped and ready to rumble. Straight onto the early evening Tokyo flight, the wide-bodied, state-of-the-art passenger jet, the Airbus A350. Finnair has a quite unique operation whereby flights arrive from Tokyo Narita, it arrives and it takes off within about three hours. It's offloaded its passengers, offloaded the cargo, it's had a check um, to make sure everything's fine. It's now rolled over here from the hangar and all the salmon that, um, that we've been following from, from Norway is still currently inside. So then the guys come and everything goes on board an hour before departure and then off it goes. So it's a really quick turnaround time. Right on cue, the salmon gets loaded, along with other general cargo. In charge of this time-critical process is Edward Homer. Uh, so far, yeah, I'd say we're quite happy with where we are quite now. At the moment, the uh, loading of the cargo has gone pretty smoothly machine it basically drives under, raises up which releases the locks and pulls the container onto the machine. We then drive onto the uh, large high loader over there which can then lift it up to the height of the aircraft door or then roll it into the aircraft and load it safely. There's quite a number of tons going onto the aircraft. Obviously, if you load the aircraft incorrectly, the balance is wrong, it can cause problems, so it's critical that we get this correct. 40 minutes of lightning-fast loading, all the air cargo is stowed on board, 
including our well-travelled salmon from the Arctic Circle. The pallets have been loaded in there, been secured in the aircraft so they can't move around. And we have made a note of the information so we can forward it to the captain so that he can ensure the temperature inside the hold is regulated to keep it nice and fresh for, for its survival. We have quite a lot of cargo, I think uh, 21.4 tons of it. OK, so now all the pre-flight checks are done, everything is in order, and now we're off to Japan. With the captain's blessing, the A350 flight is given clearance to start its 5,000-mile trek east to Narita, Tokyo, all within the 36-hour ocean-to-plate time frame to feed the Japanese sushi market. So we've just said goodbye to the plane, and by the time I wake up tomorrow morning, somebody will probably be eating this Norwegian salmon in, in Japan. So, successful day. Some difficulty this morning with the trucks coming down from northern Norway, but everything was so smooth in the terminal. Guys worked their, their bums off, uh, super happy, and uh, yeah, delighted to see it go. Next time, there's more crazy cargo, more fabulous freighters, and more demanding deadlines to hit. As Mega Air cranks it up to the max.